Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And we are back with Steph Young, the author of Proof of the Afterlife. Tell us about the uh, the podcast, Tales of Mystery Unexplained, Steph. Yeah, I do a podcast on iTunes and everywhere else that people listen to podcasts and um, talk about a lot of the cases in my books. So it's just covering, oh, well, all of the, all of the material that I, that I put in the books. All right. Uh, I want to get back to um, mediums, a particular type of, of medium, and that is uh, the manifestation medium. I remember as a, um, I guess I maybe I might've been in high school and uh, I saw, I found this book in a, an old bookstore and it was from the uh, photographs from the Victorian era, which allegedly uh, or purported to show um, manifestation mediums. And they would have this, they would call it, ec- I guess, ectoplasm emanating from their body and uh you know f- and and uh, forming well a manifestation of uh, a spirit or someone who had passed on and um i mean this this was all the rage i guess back in the victorian era uh now i understand manifestation mediums are very very rare indeed uh did you encounter any manifestation mediums they are exceptionally rare um there is a man called Stuart Alexander who lives in the northern part of England. He is a manifestation medium, a physical medium, but he's retired now. They are very, very rare. There's more historical accounts than there are current ones. And I think a lot of the reason is that it's so difficult to believe. And because of the reputation of there being a lot of trickery in the past, people are reluctant to, to try and do it themselves now. So there's less of it. It still happens, but not as often. Right, right. I think, you know, many of these photographs were proven to be fakes, uh, you know, double exposures and things like that. Um, Are there historical medical or sorry, um, manifestation mediums who you believe were legitimate? Yeah, there are. Um, I mean, there's some interesting accounts. Um, there was a man called Robert Gamba, Gambia Bolton in Boston in the 1850s. Um, sorry, not Boston, in the UK in the 1850s. He was actually the photographer of Queen Victoria's animal collection because he was a naturalist and fellow of the zoological and geographical societies. Well, at the same time, he spent seven years doing a series of experiments to try and get materialization of spirits. Um, and actually, his, his, his book's quite entertaining because he, he went to some extreme lengths to do it. And, uh, for example, the first experiment, he bought a caravan from a builder, and then he drove it to the middle of a forest, in the south of England, and then he got a blind medium who he met from the train and took the medium to the forest, to the caravan, which he'd locked up earlier to make sure nobody could get into it, and then took the medium inside, and he wrote in his notes, this is just not going to work, it's completely hopeless, this setting that we've created. Well, after a few minutes, suddenly this tall man appears in the caravan. So there's no way that anybody could have got into the caravan and the man is so tall that he has to bow his head because he's going to knock it on the ceiling of the caravan so he was encouraged by this experiment so he continued to carry them out and the second one he did was actually in a suburban house in london in the middle of the daytime and again he reported that figures appeared and he said that they came kind of rising up from the floor and the sort of vapory mist 
which would form into a dough-like substance. And from that, it would pulsate and move up and down and sway, and eventually a, a head and then a torso and the, all of the entire body would appear and start talking and walking around. And he would touch the spirit and write the notes. You know, the flesh is found to be warm and firm and the hands and feet and face quite perfect. Um, he also said at some of the seances that he saw babies appear. He said in particular two babies appeared that had been stillborn and one of them had hideous deformities that it had had when it was born. And in fact, the mother of this baby happened to be present in the seance room at the time. Um, he then did a experiment in the heart of London in a place called Whitehall, which is where all the politicians work. And two politicians there wanted to come to a seance he was holding, but they didn't want anyone to know because they probably would have lost their jobs. So... It's in a really posh office, and they hadn't actually put all their paperwork and things away on the desk. Well, spirits started physically appearing, and then this little creature appeared. And so Gambia's saying to these spirits, this creature is running quite wildly around, and he's saying, please keep the creature under control. And the spirits are saying, I'm sorry, we can't do that. And so this little creature scurries all over the desk, throws the paperwork everywhere, and it's absolute mayhem. At the same time, the seat that the medium is sitting on, the chair suddenly gives way, and the medium falls into the arms of Gambier. So it's quite funny. And at the same seance, they had some guests from India who spoke Parsi, and suddenly these figures materialise, and they start speaking in Parsi, and they're having an argument with the two Indian guests about how their bodies should not be buried but should be cremated. And Gambia writes in his notes, the sound of the argument, the noise of it was deafening. So it's quite amusing, some of the accounts he's written about. And right. um, at the same seance, a woman appeared who apparently dematerialized in front of them like the Cheshire cat, sort of just, just evaporated. What, what do you think ectoplasm actually is? Well, from all the accounts that I've looked at of these physical mediums, the description is that it seems to be an energy form that comes out of the medium. And in fact, a lot of the old accounts, um, <laughs> some of the experimenters were getting the spirits to stand on weighing platforms, and then they would weigh the medium and compare the weights, and the medium would have lost weight when a spirit was out walking around in the room. So the idea seems to be that this energy comes out of the medium and, and also supposedly probably from some of the guests as well. And from this energy source, that's how they create their physical bodies. Um, interestingly, I went to do my master's in Reiki healing uh, a couple of months ago, and it was in a, um, uh, a shop in, in the centre of London, and we were doing it in the basement. So with Reiki, you have to be attuned by the person teaching you. So they go through all of these sort of hand signals and things. I'm sitting there thinking, this is an absolute load of rubbish. I can't believe I'm doing this. And then, so I'm so sceptical. And then we have a five-minute break. So I go up to the street level, just to go outside and get some fresh air. And I look over, my eye just looks over at the big street sign, and I think, I can't read it. I can't read the street sign, because there's this swirling, vibrating, pulsing. It looks like a silvery white morphing, I don't know what it is, energy, I suppose. So I look at this sign, and I think, this isn't, it must be my eyes. So I look at all the shop signs, I see the same flowing, fluxing energy again. I look at the people that are walking past me. I cannot see their eyes anymore. All I can see is this swirling mass of vibrating, pulsing energy. And I'm so freaked out by it because I'm thinking something has happened to my eyes. It's obviously a medical thing. What am I going to do if this is permanent? How am I even going to get home on the train tonight? So I go back down into the basement because I'm in shock. And I said to the tutor, 
um, has anybody ever described this? And she goes, oh, don't worry, you've just entered the Matrix. It will get weirder from here. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. Say what? <laughs> it will It'll get, get weirder, weirder from here. <laughs> my word. I know. Uh, so when we talked about the medium whose face would shift and morph and ripple, maybe that's kind of, maybe that's what I was seeing. I mean... You know, a skeptic could say, oh, that was just your blood pressure. Well, maybe, but I've never, ever had that experience before. And I didn't believe in Reiki, and I still don't really. I'm still <laughs> still skeptical, but I cannot explain it. And, in fact, when I went to the Spiritual Association of Great Britain uh, one day, the place where Winston Churchill and Conan Doyle used to go, and I, I sat in the development circle, and then they were giving a platform demonstration afterwards, so I went and sat in the audience. I could see the same energy again on the back of the chair in front of me. And I'm thinking, oh, no, not again. And then suddenly I'm seeing a bird flying around the room. And so after the demonstration, I said to the person sitting next to me, who was a member there, and it was my first visit, and I said, whose bird is that flying around? He said, what bird? There's no bird. So uh, strange things happen, don't they? Uh, you've entered the matrix. Uh, <laughs> when ectoplasm is exiting the medium's body, are they in, in any physical danger? Well, yes, the theory is that they are. I mean, I will just add that I spoke to Stephen Upton, who was a former president at the Arthur Finley College, and he has said they don't use ectoplasm anymore. Um, but we can go, go into that in a bit. In a bit. But um, when the medium, there was a medium called Alec Harris, who was English, but he emigrated to South Africa because his son had gone there. So he and his wife moved there. And a doctor called Dr. Douglas Baker, he was training to become a medical doctor, and he kept hearing from surgeons and doctors there that they had been to seances with a man called Alec Harris, and they had physically touched and felt the heartbeat, seen the veins of materialized spirits. So he started studying Alec Harris. Well, one day, Alec Harris's wife was arranging for the next seance to be held, and a friend of hers, who was called Viddy Jones, Mrs. Viddy Jones, she had been, come, become a convert because she had seen in a previous seance her dead husband, who was a mining magnate, he had materialized, and she'd held him, and they'd kissed. So she was converted. Well, this seance that Alec's wife was arranging was to be their last one for a while because it was draining him doing all these seances. So they wanted a break, but Biddy Jones said, well, look, I've got two people from the local spiritualist church. They want to come. We can't cancel now. Well, so she, they, uh, Louis said, all right, we'll go ahead then, we'll go ahead. Well, when the time came for the seance, the day before, these two guests contacted Biddy Jones and said, oh, we can't come, but could somebody else from the church come in our place? And she said, fine, that's okay. So the seance began with these two strangers. And the spirit materialized came out of the cabinet, which often is just a curtain where the medium is sitting behind the curtain. The curtain is pulled back, the medium is sitting in the chair, but there's spirits coming out and walking around the room. And they go up to the guests and they start shaking their hands. But Louis, Harris's wife, says she thinks that the spirits are very reluctant tonight. They don't seem their normal, their normal self. They look a bit wary. Well... As they get around to these two strangers, they go to shake their hands, and one of the strangers jumps up and grabs the spirit. Because if they've gone there, little do the mediums and the, the wife know, but they are undercover news people, newspaper people who have gone there specifically to expose what they believe is a giant fraud. Ah, you know, right. they believe it's Alec Harris dressed up as a, as a spirit. So the newspaper man grabs the spirit... The spirit starts to literally disintegrate as he's holding him. So he falls to the floor. Uh, the other guest 
the other newspaper man rushes to the curtains, flings them open, and there's all these cameramen outside. So the light flashes go off and blinds everybody in the room. The medium's wife, meanwhile, is furious because she knows the danger that the ectoplasm is going to cause because it's going to hurtle back into the body of Alec Harris, her husband, the medium. So she's flailing around, attacking this man on the floor. Meanwhile, Alec... Alec Harris is suffering tremendously because this ectoplasm is shot back at breakneck speed into his body. And a fact, he was really seriously ill for a long time and he didn't, didn't really recover afterwards. So there are stories of it being really dangerous. What happened to that newspaper man? I mean, uh, did he go back and write an article and, exp- and, and report well, what he had <laughs> actually witnessed? No. Um, She said he was so terrified. His eyes were wide with terror because he thought it was all just a hoax, you know, so he couldn't believe it was actually true. But no, I don't think they did because when they developed the film, it was all blank. They they, they didn't manage to get any photos at all, almost like the spirits had stopped them, I suppose. I don't know. I guess he was so traumatized by it that he didn't know. Have you you witnessed ectoplasm or have you seen a physical manifestation? No, I haven't seen it. Um, our, our development circle, I would love it if we were just working on physical mediumship. Our development circle is actually more about training people to go on to work on platforms, you know, as giving messages. Um, I haven't, no. I, I've had, a, we were doing a meditation one day and I've had um, experience where I can hear and feel footsteps coming, pounding, coming towards me. And I'm thinking, they're going to hit me any second. They'll make contact with my body, but they never did. I've had that, um, and we were doing table tipping one night, and where you, you, you just rest your fingers on the top of the table around in a circle, and you're hoping that the table will start moving or levitating or something. Well, to be honest, I was getting very frustrated because we had a couple of people who were guests that we'd never met before, and I was convinced that the lady sitting opposite me was pushing the table, and I'm sure she was. So, so you still get you still get cheats now, but as we sat there, we'd been there for about an hour or so, and the table's not really moving, and I'm thinking, oh, I can't wait to go home, and suddenly I get this poke on my back, and then I get a prod on my shoulder, and like my hair starts getting pulled, and I'm looking around, I can see everybody's hands, so it's not their hands, and I'm getting poked and tickled by invisible fingers. So I've had that sort of thing happen, but I haven't seen ectoplasm. Sounds like some mischievous uh, ghosts, some children perhaps. You mentioned being poked and prodded by uh, children. Um, do, you ever, do you ever bring anything home with you after you, you leave one of these developing circles? Um, about a month ago, I think I did. I... I was laying in bed trying to get to sleep, and I knew there was a presence in the room. And the way, for me personally, when I feel that, um, my heart starts to go faster, and it's almost like I'm getting goosebumps, literally. Um, and so I can I get a physical reaction to it. But I couldn't see them. I just was aware of feeling them. And at the same time, there was an image that I could see in my mind, clairvoyantly, of this man standing in the corner of the room, just a really pale figure with a bowler hat on. I'm thinking, oh, no, I don't know what to do about this. So actually I got up and I went to a different room and just sort of waited a while and then went back to bed and it was gone. And I remember talking to my development tutors about it and they said, well, you know, you'd come back from a trance workshop. And, in fact, when I came home from the trance workshop and I, I was in the bathroom and I saw my eyes in the mirror... I didn't recognize my eyes anymore. They looked like somebody else's. So I don't think I'd fully come out of what had been going on at the development circle. Um, I wasn't particularly scared because it didn't, nothing sort of hurt me, you know. I mean, I've had experiences where I've been meditating at home, which is kind of how you get the spirits to contact you. And one day I was lying there and this gigantic face appears in front of me. I I don't mean literally physically. I mean you can see it. It's almost like you've got your eyes closed. Imagine opening your eyes back up and there's someone standing there in front of you. You can see them. It's that vivid. And 
it's so realistic and vivid that you can't sort of say you're just imagining it. Well, this giant face in front of me, and at the same time I got an instant knowing that this person was some somebody related to a lady in the workshop. But bearing in mind we don't we deliberately don't know anything about each other in the workshops in the in the circle because we don't want to be aware of knowledge that we can give readings and then we're just saying what we already know about them and it's coming from us. So I knew this man was related to her, but it was the first time it had happened something like that had happened to me, so I I just cut the contact. But when I went to the circle the next week, I said, Oh to this lady, I said, Oh, have you have you got someone in your family who looks like this? I said, I feel like it was your father She goes, It wasn't my father, but it was my father's cousin and they were inseparable when they were alive. They were like brothers and in fact, we ended up working together in a pair that evening, and he came back again, and I could see him. He was showing me, he was a traveller, he was showing me the caravan he lived in, the horses he had, where he lived, showing me his mum, his children, showing me driving along the motorway, and all of it kind of matched to what she said his life had been like. Um, so, uh, no, I haven't had an attachment. We're really, really careful when we do our work in the workshop. And I, I think I'm a complete beginner in all of this, so I probably sound, you know, very naive compared to a lot of expert mediums, but it's really important to do it in a safe environment. I wouldn't recommend trying to experiment at home on your own without joining a circle because we do it to make sure that we only get friendly spirits, you know? Are you dealing with um, the the spirits of actual people who have passed on or is it are you um open to the idea that you may in fact be dealing with something that's not human in other words a human spirit you're dealing with i don't know some sort of a demonic entity well i know that some people say that can happen and yes you could have bad spirits come through but when a spirit comes through so i'll give you an example one day we had some well, we had a workshop, and so people from outside could come and sit and join us. And so we'd never met these people before. And we had to do an exercise, which is like speed dating, but it was actually speed reading. So you sit with somebody, and you go, right, give them a reading for two minutes, move on to the next one. So I was sitting with a lady I'd never met, and she came from a foreign country because of her accent, but I didn't know where. And my task was... I had to get a relative of hers who had died, any relative. I didn't know anything about her. So I closed my eyes, and suddenly I could see this man, and I could see all of his features. He's wearing outdoor clothing, and he's holding a shotgun. And he starts to show me the riverbank that he's standing by, and then he walks to a really old stone cottage, and he goes inside, and I can see it, but it's very sparse. So I'm describing all of this. And she said, oh, that's my uncle who had died. And she said, could you tell me how he died? And I said, yeah, he was shot with a shotgun. And it just came out of me. And um, she said, yeah, that's right. That's correct. So when you have examples of things that match up completely with what the dead relative died of or what they looked like or where they lived, I suppose you could say it could be some demonic spirit impersonating them. But that doesn't really kind of match up with you know, a negative entity, because I've only experienced family of people coming through. We've never had something that's disruptive or means harm to anyone. Hmm. Um, can anyone do this? I mean, you came into this as a, a skeptic, and now you seem to have yeah. be, you're, you're developing abilities. Uh, is it is it something that anyone can learn to do? Well, if I can, I would say probably anyone can. I, I, I'm very lucky to have found two really good tutors, but there's got to be lots of uh, other tutors around. Um, yes, I would say if I can do it, then anyone can do it. Um, I, I don't find it easy. And, you know, it, it, I mean, quite often we're in absolute hysterics because I might be sitting with um, somebody doing pair work I get a spirit to come through and they're just standing there and nothing's happening. And I, I, I'm just hopeless sometimes. So, Or you get a message that's so inexplicable. Um, 
for example, we were doing pair work again, and it was a stranger. I'd never met the woman. And all I got was this giant flapping yellow fish in front of me. That's all I could see. And I thought, oh, I can't say this. This is so embarrassing. What on earth could that have to do with anything? But because my tutor was listening, I thought, I'm going to have to say something. So I, got, I tried to get the fish out of my mind, and it kind of vanished. And then I saw this red car with a blonde woman, two blonde children in the back, driving down a street. And they're driving to a house. And at the top of the house, I can see this big portal window. And I get the feeling that it's by the seaside because I can see seagulls. And so I'm telling all of this to the woman. And she said, yes, that's my dead sister-in-law. And then this giant flapping fish comes back again. And I thought, oh, no. So I, eventually I said, well, I'm so sorry, but that's all I'm getting at the moment. And she said, and, and, and I said to her, I think I can see your mum and dad. I think it's them. But I didn't know if they were dead or alive. So I'm just saying it. And I feel so stupid. But she goes, well, we were all allergic to fish as children. So it was a family joke. Mum and dad would always threaten to cook us fish supper, you know, to make us poison. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So things like that. <laughs> so, but then if I, if I can get that to happen, uh, then I would have thought anybody can. I mean, I, uh, but then the thing is, it's not me. I, it's not me. I don't have these abilities. It's the spirits. They put these images, these words, these scenes. They put it all into your mind. And in fact, I get so nervous and so worked up when I'm doing these exercises, because I'm so embarrassed, because I'm doing it with other mediums who are so good at it, that I get, I'm excruciatingly embarrassed. And the more worked up I get, the less likely it is that to work. If, you, if I go in there and think, well, it's not going to work, I'll just sit here, something does work. So it's almost like you have to get your mind out of the way of it. And that's the difficulty, you know, because you constantly think, why am I seeing a giant fish in front of me? That's ridiculous. You know, you dismiss it all. But then our tutors say to us, well, hold on, though. The messages that are coming through, yes, you do need to try and decipher them. But remember, they're not messages for you. So they're not going to mean anything to you. They're messages for the family member you're sitting with. And when that came through for this lady, it, you know, it really made her laugh. And she, and she instantly knew why it was happening. Are you able to now turn it off, uh, or now that you've opened this well, up, this ability, it, it, is it nonstop? No, for me it's not, because I'm not a natural at it, you see. So I don't, I'm not completely open to it all the time. If you said to me now, oh, give me um, a reading, get my uh, deceased relative to come through, I, I very much doubt I could because I would be so nervous and worried and anxious about it. So I don't have that natural ability. It's something that it, 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 it's had to take me some time to learn, and I have to, you have to go into sort of a meditative state in order to open up to it. Other people that I've met are wide open to it all the time. So I think it very much depends on each person. Because there are so few people that... that, uh, that either have the ability or have developed their ability. I mean, what's happening on the other side? Are they like lined up around the corner? It's like, like <laughs> at a phone phone booth waiting their turn kind so of. that they can find yeah. someone to communicate with. Well, it's funny because um, there's a, a kind of common phrase amongst the mediums that I've met, and they all say it's like a busload of spirits arrive at the same time. Because actually, when you get contact with one, you quite often find that another one comes and you've got another different person standing there. You don't know who they are or why they've come. And the messages can get really confusing because they're so keen to come and talk to you. So, yes, it's like a busload of spirits arriving and it can get quite hectic because, yes, they, they want to come. And we were doing a, a workshop once and my colleague, one of the people in the group, he started going into trance and then he started talking in a voice that was not his and crying and saying, I'm lost, I'm lost, I'm lost. It turned out that it was a spirit who didn't know he had died. So my tutors were encouraging him to say, can you see the light? Because he was saying, it's dark, I can't see anything. And they were saying, look for the light. Your family are there. And they guided him, and they do this a lot. It's called rescue work, and they, they make sure that he can cross over properly. Well, um, this happens a lot. 
Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought now. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask you, because you got into this field because you were researching a book. Now that the book is finished, are you going to continue to pursue mediumship or are you going to move on to something else? Oh, no, I'm definitely going to continue doing it because before I did it, I always had a belief as a child in the afterlife, but no proof of it. But I am definitely going to continue. Um, I don't, I'm don't. i not trying to do it professionally, but it, it, the confirmation and the comfort that it gives you, you know, to have your family members give you messages. I, I, I'll give you a silly example. Um, one day I had, a, I had an interview that I wanted to go and interview someone, and it was quite a long drive. And it was going to be a couple of hours drive there and back. And I had to get to my development group as well. So when I left, I hadn't eaten breakfast. I stopped off at a motorway service station, and all I bought was a bunch of bananas. So I remember standing at the cashier, and they said, anything else, any petrol? I said, no, no, just these, thanks. And I kind of waved the bananas at them for some reason. Well, all I ate that day was a series of bananas because I didn't have time to do anything else, and I just about got to the group in time in the evening. Well, we were sitting in pairs, and then the message that comes through is talking about me eating these bananas. It's telling me all the things I was doing that day as I was driving. And it's also talking about the medium sitting next to me. She said, I can't say this. I can't say this. I've said bananas. That's silly enough. And now all I'm seeing is screwdrivers. And she's saying, this is ridiculous. I'm obviously imagining it. But the thing is, screwdrivers are highly relevant to me because um, I've lost a lot of family members and I've got all of their tools. So whenever I'm fixing something in the house, I never put the screwdrivers away. I always leave them out. So I've got screwdrivers everywhere all over the house because it reminds me of, you know, my uncles and my, uh, my family members who, who they belonged to, and it gives me so much comfort. So she was talking about these screwdrivers. So when I get messages like that or when I'm told a family joke that nobody could possibly know, it gives me so much confirmation and, and proof right. that we carry on. Steph, one of the more um, uh, touching cases in the book, Proof of the Afterlife, and in fact, you include an excerpt in the book uh, before the uh, introduction uh, about a woman who, uh, I guess she makes contact or sees a full-on apparition of her late little boy. I I believe he was five years old when he passed. Can you tell me about that? Yes. Well, she was at a seance. And, in fact, it was actually her, a, a newspaper reporter, her husband, and this little boy's voice materialized and said to his father, um, I, I want my mummy, and I want to talk about the bottle that she put into my coffin when I was buried. Well, the reporter, father, he didn't know about this, so he asked his wife, and she confirmed that she'd put a little bottle of scent into his coffin before he died. Um, And at the same seance, um, there were physical materializations as well. That's so touching. That's um, a remarkable story. Um, A lady called Isa Northage, who was also a medium who had physical manifestations, and um, one day she was doing some table tipping, sitting around, and um, a murder victim came to her, It was in the newspapers that he'd been murdered, but they didn't know where his body was. And again, he came to her and he said, I'm I'm so-and-so, I was murdered, and you'll find my body in this place. And his body was found there. So I do think it happened. With regards to search and rescue, I've never really heard that before. However, there was a case not so long ago where a lady had driven accidentally into a river in the wilderness, and she had her young baby inside, the lady unfortunately died, but when first responders and search and rescue were looking for her, they were alerted to the car under the water because they could hear the baby crying. Oh, the wow. The baby was, was not conscious at the time. That's remarkable. And another, another case, actually, um, a lady and her son, they had left their hometown. They were going to go and live with their boy's father, And they vanished on um, a country highway on a very winding road. 
Well, as the search went on, they were looking in every county because they didn't know which one she'd be in. And a local policeman had heard about the story, and he happened to be passing that highway. And um, he thought he could see some skid marks from the tyres. So it led him to look down over an embankment. And reports came out in the newspapers that he had heard the little boy shouting for help. But again, the boy was completely unconscious and the woman was dead. So there are cases where voices have been heard. There's another excerpt um, in, the, in the book. How would you like to feel the hand of a man who's been dead for 100 years? What happened there? Well, that's come from the man called Stuart Alexander, who is a, a current physical medium, although he's retired, and he had a development circle in Hull. Um, in fact, it took him, he was very persistent because it took him 13 years in their development circle for anything to, to happen, but he persisted and persisted. And when things started to happen, um, the, they used a trumpet, which is, it looks like a sort of child toy. It's a sort of conical shape. And the trumpet started moving, and a voice was coming out of it. Well, as things progressed each week, it soon turned out that he would be tied into a chair, you know, the way they used to do it with all the ropes, so there's no way you can get out of it. But um, suddenly, they would have a table in there, they would have the lights on so everybody could see, and suddenly, this kind of white blob would appear on the table, and it would morph and change into the shape of a hand. And I've got numerous, multiple witness accounts of people who went there and said about it. And, for example, one guy, um, Kai Moody, said that a black mass seemed to sort of swell on the table and then gradually morph into a hand. And this hand, they would hear a voice, and the hand would say, how would you like to feel the hand of a man who's been dead 100 years? Because the spirit was saying that this was him, this was his hand, and it would go around and shake people's hands. And people would describe it as a perfectly normal hand, just like anybody else's, and it would shake their hands. And then also they would have physical people materialise. But then they would... And, and the reason why... Because it's very easy to say, OK, this is all trickery. You know, it's somebody dressed up as a spirit. But... The reason it wasn't is because they would melt into the floor as if they were made of wax and completely, completely evaporate and maybe leave a bit of pulsating white energy on the floor. So it didn't seem possible that this was sort of trickery. And it happened with the medium Alec Harris in South Africa where we had the doctor, Dr. Baker, and all his medical professionals. And they would be, you know, using stethoscopes and spinning the heart the heartbeat and the pulse, but they would describe how the spirits would sink slowly into the floor in front of them. And Dr. Baker said how the, how the spirits materialise. He said, if you can imagine that you're in the sea and a jellyfish is coming up from the floor of the seabed with all its appendages floating to the top, and then it suddenly morphs into a person, but when they dematerialise, he said, I've been talking to a spirit holding their hand, and as they've gone to leave, he said, and their face is perfectly normal with their pulse and veins and everything else, but suddenly the lower part of the jaw disintegrates and evaporates, and then they just slowly, gradually sink in upon themselves and vanish. He said, how can that be fake? When, how can that be a, a, a trick? Right, right. Where do you suppose they go when they disintegrate? Well, I mean, the, the historical medium, it seems to be the impression is that this energy goes back into the body of the medium. That's the, that's the belief, or that's what people have witnessed. You know, um, the same medium, little spirit children used to emerge from out of him, so they'd, this energy would flow out of his body, and then these little children would be standing next to him. And then when it went back in, and the mediums would be sort of, groaning and going half unconscious or losing half of their body weight. So it seems to be, that's the established opinion anyway, that it goes back into the body of the medium, that, that they borrow the medium's energy. 
it, it must take tremendous a tremendous amount of energy for the spirit to manifest number one and, and number I, and number two do they do they require instruction on the other side on how to do this well, the belief is that they have a sort of group of controllers who, because you get a busload of spirits, so they kind of control who's allowed to come through and in what order. And the idea is that they're sort of they're sort of spirit scientists on the other side, manipulating this energy so that the spirits that manifest can 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 utilise it. That's that's the idea, anyway. In my experience, all all I've ever had are positive experiences. So. The spirits are coming back and they're healing people or they're coming back and they're giving comforting messages about your family in the afterlife. So if they're not coming back and giving disturbing dreams or they're tampering with things in the home or they're harming you, I, I, don't, I don't see how they can be bad spirits masquerading as good because if they are, they're not doing a very good job because they're giving you positive things. They're helping you all the time. And, I mean, I know the kind of the idea is that I mean, I go to church and, um, you know, I, I tell the vicar all about this and he's fine about it because, I mean, Jesus was one of the original healers, you know. So they were communicating with spirits in the Bible, in, in my opinion anyway. So I, I just don't see the bad side of it. Yes, demons, bad spirits do exist, but I don't think they interfere as much as, as maybe the reputation is given to them. All right, Carl, thank you for that. Uh, Armando is in Montebello, California. Armando, welcome to Coast. Good morning. Good morning, Steph. Um, my question is, um, I've heard you talk about energy and um, meditation during this broadcast. So my experience, I was, I don't really meditate, but I wanted to try it out. First time I, well, the sec, this one time, I was sitting there meditating, trying to meditate, and not so long after I started, I started to feel this weird kind of energy flowing through me. It felt like, you know, when you're cold and you shimmy, you're like, brr, and your whole like back shakes. It felt like that a lot stronger, and it, and it was going for a while, and I was still meditating. It kind of scared me, so I stopped it, you know, pretty quick. And then I tried meditating maybe about a month after it happened again. And this time I thought to myself, like, I'm going to, nothing happened. I didn't get hurt. Nothing weird happened. So I'm going to, let's see what happens. And I let it happen and it kept going and going and going and going. And it was like, it was like it was physical activity. My, my whole body was kind of shaking as if, you know, you know how the, a snake. Okay, Armando, because we're short on time here, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Is it, uh, Steph, is it possible that while he was meditating, he was opening himself up to some, some kind of possession or oppression? Yeah, it sounds like it, because then that's what I've had when I've gone into trance, not knowing that that was going to happen to me, and my entire body was violently shaking. So it, it could have been that a spirit was um, what they call sort of blending with your body, so it was trying to sort of come into you. But I, I, to call it possession, we don't know if it had been a good or bad spirit. It was probably perhaps maybe even a spirit guide of yours, so it was probably a friendly spirit. But it sounds like they were trying to sort of come into you. And the reason they do that is that so that they can use your voice. They can, t you know, when you start talking, it right. would be their voice. So okay. um, it doesn't mean it was a bad thing. I would think that if you didn't get anything alarming happen, it was probably just a friendly, a friendly protector spirit coming. All right, Armando, there you go. Well, Steph, these uh, three hours have flown by. Thank you so much. I know you, you uh, hung in there for an extra hour. We appreciate it. It's great meeting you. I hope we'll speak again. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Proof of the afterlife. The dead don't die. True tales of the afterlife. Steph Young. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.